So when you were talking about the suppression of this knowledge, um, I guess my question uh, to you is, do you subscribe to any kind of idea like Illuminati, um, you know, curtailing this, and um, does any type of negative kind of ET presence fit in to that model, where it's kind of been keeping it like a prison planet type of idea? Well, the question is, is um, in terms of the information being kept secret, is there some um, Illuminati type entity or perhaps even ET presence keeping it secret? Uh, I doubt it in the way that it's the mythology, the internet mythology would say it is. Um, I think it has more to do with the fact that there are, let's say, call cartels, interest groups that are also competing interest groups human, not ET, that don't want certain aspects of this out. And there are points where they cooperate and there are points where they don't. Um, now there's something, the, the latest iteration of it, I've been told from my, some of my intelligence sources, is called SIG, S-I-G, which is the Senior Interagency uh, Intelligence Group. And the SIG, um, which, you know, from the old majesty and majestic entity from the Truman era. Uh, and uh, on some of the documents I have, it says magic, M-A-J-I-C, um, classification. Uh, those are, you know, intelligence groups that operate out of normal chain of command. Um, they work with people in different countries. Uh, and then they will usually have representation from different interest groups, such as religious, technological, financial, um, macroeconomic, et cetera, and so on. Um, and so there's not a, there's a really a simplistic view that there's sort of like one group, it's the Bilderbergers, it's the Illuminati, it's the this, I said. It was interesting because I, a few years ago I was at a meeting in San Francisco and it was after the Disclosure Project launched and Henry Dakin, who at the Dakin Toy Company was hosting a, a sort of a reception at his loft in, um, in San Francisco. And um, Judith Scutch was there, who was the original publisher of the Course in Miracles with Marianne Wilson, and very big supporter, and her husband was a colonel. And she was friends with this man who had just been up at the Bohemian Grove, with the whole Bohemian Grove, it was like 2,500 people. And this issue came up. And the issue of, uh, it was a very wealthy European financier. Um, and so this issue came up about uh, disclosure, because it had all been in the news. And they had someone there to get up on the stage and tell everyone that they were part of a high, very high governmental scientific entity that had looked into this, that none of it was true, that it was all just misinterpretations and you know, swamp gas and Venus rising or whatever, the usual blather. And all those 2,500 people took it to heart and believed it because it was their peerage. So I want to talk about peer-to-peer -peer, um, containment systems. So you have one group of peerage it's called the U.S. Senate. Out of those hundred guys, one or two people are read into or, or know about this subject. Their task is to lie to the other 99 or 98. Bilderbergers, there might be a handful of them. They lie to the rest. Bohemian Grove, same thing. So people have this very simplistic view of how secrecy like this would be maintained and that there's some sort of vast sort of conspiracy and there'd be all these people. Um, because of compartmentalization, there would be people, and compartmentalization is where you have, uh, you know, a very walled off area of operation where it's compartmented to that particular task or research. And it is so narrowly focused and the people in there have such blind, they don't know what the person in the next cubicle is doing, never mind what the big picture is. So it's very easy when you have extreme compartmentalization to keep most people in the dark about what's really going on. 
and then there will be a handful of people who really know. And they may, you know, this committee, if you want to look at it that way, uh, this intelligence group, might have two or three hundred people from different countries who are themselves members of different elite groups. And those folks would then lie to their brethren in that peerage to deceive them. And that's their job. And they're trained professionally to lie. Um, so it isn't as if it, so most, I would say 99.99999% of everything I've ever seen that's out there on this trash dump called the internet uh, isn't, has any, has almost no bearing in reality. Um, because it's just too imbecilic. It would not be operating that way. Now, for special compartment, you know, top secret, TSSCI, top secret special compartment intelligence to operate is the compartment part. It's not the top secret part. There are 980,000 people in the United States with top secret clearances, which means they're common as dirt. Um, it's the compartment you're in, all right? So you may have Q clearance, what used to be the you know, clearance for nuclear weapons and stuff. But it doesn't mean that just because you have Q clearance, you have clearance into um, electromagnetogravitics. In fact, you almost certainly would not. So, and the same thing goes in for, for corporate. Uh, same thing goes for, I, it was interesting, I was at, in San Francisco uh, at another time, and there was a woman who lived in Pacific Heights, the end of Broadway, where all the $100 million mansions, you know, the Getty home, and. Larry Ellison, all these people live, and she was hosting her neighbors for a salon. And I was the guest for this dinner party, and you know, I mean, there were all these people, and the guy on one side of me had been the chairman of SRI, Stanford Research International. And they had had contracts dealing with this issue, but he said, I was only the chairman of SRI, so I didn't have a need to know what was really going on. So because my, I've never been in the government, but I have all these hundreds of people who provided information from all these different walks of life over the last 50 years in terms of experience, people going all the way back to the 50s, 60 years, that sort of, I've sort of become a, sort of a source for that. So he was at, picking my brain. Here was the chairman of SRI. And then uh, across the table was the chairman of AT&T. Now, AT&T has had a lot of contracts with the intelligence community dealing with this issue. But the chairman of AT&T didn't know about it because he was only the chairman of AT&T. He was not read into. Uh, so it, it's compartmented at corporate, governmental, political, and religious levels. Um, and uh, it, it's not so simple that you, there would be some one entity you can name and then, you know, sort of vent your spleen, that group is. Now, the question of whether there are interstellar civilizations that are cooperating or facilitating that, I'm very skeptical of. But it could be theoretically possible that in the early days, they were hoping that there would be some kind of a, a rapprochement with uh, leaders, military or political, and have had, had had contact. An ongoing level of that is less likely, but if it is, if it is happening, then we need a CE5 effort even more. Here's what I always say to people. Let's say that there are, they say now, 11 billion star systems in the Milky Way that have um, Earth-like planets around them. And the Milky Way is only one of billions of galaxies. The likelihood is that there are countless numbers of civilizations out there. And you can't prove a negative. I can't say everyone is at a, a state of enlightenment. I will say that if they become interstellar and they haven't blown themselves up yet, they're more evolved than we are. Um, however, it could be that there are some that have interests and ethical concerns that don't comport with contemporary human ones. But that's where you would need to have even more of a diplomatic communicative effort. And the worst thing you can do is relegate that to people in covert military operations because they're only looking at the universe with rose-colored military glasses on. And it's all about power and control. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of like, 
when uh, there used to be a, a U.S. senator from Virginia uh, named John Warner, not the current Mark Warner, no relation. And he had been chairman of armed services and, and intel, various things. And uh, I knew he was involved with uh, Majestic, Majesty, and, MJ, and Magic. Um, and he had been uh, one of the secretaries of the Navy way back, I believe, or undersecretary of the Navy. And um, one of his, uh, a member of my team who had dated him for a while, uh, went out at his place in Virginia, met with him, and brought this whole issue up. And he basically listened to her and said nothing, stone-faced. And where she left off the previous conversation to that exact word, he picked it up and continued. And just that issue was just sequestered out. He would not acknowledge it at all. And my, my, one of my military advisors had the same experience with Admiral Harry Train, who did the exact same thing uh, when it was brought up. Though, except he also said, he said, I am profoundly disinterested in discussing this issue with you, and dropped it. Okay, and that was the same admiral who was at Atlantic Command when we went to full code zebra because of these craft off the coast of the uh, eastern coast uh, of the United States. Um, so I think that, you know, they're, they're very, very disciplined about that. Um, and I've met with a number of these sort of characters. And, um, and yet you have other people like Senator Claiborne Pell who the Pell Grants, anyone who was really poor like I was who got a Pell Grant to go to college. <laughs> um, uh, I was at a dinner party with him. In fact, my wife and I were, were, were there and, um, for Noetic Sciences Institute. And uh, um, after the dinner party, we went out on, on the patio of this beautiful home in San Rafael near uh, George Lucas's place, right next to Skywalker Ranch. And, and we were there, and, and Senator Pell and I were talking, and he just sort of epitomized noblesse oblige, and was this wonderful guy, very, very genuine, crossed the aisle, tried to do great things for the country, um, patrician, very great. And we were talking, and, uh, you know, and he turned to me, he says, well, Dr. Greer, would you come and, and brief my staff on this? Uh, and I said, well, sure, any time you want me to. I, he says, because we've asked about this and no one's ever told us anything. And he'd been on every committee. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was looking at him and I looked up at the stars and I looked at him and I said, you know, you've been deprived of dealing with the ultimate foreign relations issue and you're the chairman of the foreign relations <laughs> committee. And I pointed to the stars above my head and he looked at me through those you know, horn rimmed glasses and blinked and he says, well, Dr. Grimm, I'm afraid you might be right. I said, well, I am. <laughs> and it was really a poignant, but really in a funny but sad moment. That here's this guy, you know, had been in Congress or the Senate since the 50s, then been denied any information on this, who would have been a great interstellar diplomat. And instead, the wise, the enlightened, um, the peace-loving people who should have been handling this, got shoved to the side, relegated to the scrap heap of history. And the warmongers and the control freaks and the misanthropic money whores, uh, I have a few other adjectives I'll leave off, uh, <laughs> kind of took it over, which is what happened. As Eisenhower famously said, beware the military industrial complex. He was specifically talking about the fact he lost control over this and other issues in 1956 when uh, Nelson Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Commission, Lawrence's brother, Nelson Rockefeller reorganized the Department of Defense and CIA under the Rockefeller Commission in 1956. So no president since 1956 has, has had, even if they've known about the issue, they have not had operational control over these projects. So it's been an unconstitutional out, off the rails for the last almost 60 years. Mm -hmm.